Hello, and welcome to this JCLS Author Talk with Jennifer Greer. I'm Carrie Turney-Ross, Adult Services Coordinator for Jackson County Library Services. Uh, Jennifer Greer is here today to talk to us about her debut novel, A Desperate Place. In this novel, Whit McKenna and Detective Katie Riggs are an unlikely pair, and they investigate three murders that share one gruesome secret. McKenna is a new crime writer for the Medford Daily Chronicle, and she moved to Medford, Oregon with her daughter, uh, daughters after a harrowing experience as an LA Times report, reporter on assignment in Afghanistan. Uh, Riggs, a cancer survivor and experienced homi homicide investigator, studies the dead almost as if she's searching for answers to her own near-death experience. McKenna and Riggs trade leads quid pro quo as they independently race to investigate a series of murders while the killer is on the hunt. Jennifer Greer holds a degree in English literature and journalism. She worked as a crime writer for the Fresno Bee. Interested in foreign affairs, she traveled to Russia and Europe. She lived in London studying history, art, and literature and she reported from the war regions of Croatia and wrote an award-winning article on the women and children refugees. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jennifer Greer, and I will let you take it away from here. Well, thank you, Carrie. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate that. Um, I am not sure how many of you have actually already read my book or how many are interested in the book, but um, just to give you a little bit of information, I've got some fun news that I can share. Um, Kirkus Review chose my book as one of the top 12 uh, mystery suspense books of 2020. So that's kind of exciting. And uh, my publisher, Crooked Lane Books, has submitted my book for consideration for the Edgar Award. That's also very exciting. Um, I think I'll start with I, the reviews. I have had most of my reviews tend to center on the two uh, female characters in the book, McKenna and Riggs. And I think it's because they share a really, um, a dichotomy in their jobs, but they also share a very deep relationship with each other. They're best friends. One is a journalist, a crime reporter, and the other is, a medical examiner detective. So in the real world, detectives and journalists don't generally mix. But in my book, they have um, a really great relationship and they encourage each other. And at the same time, on occasion, they share leads uh, depending on the circumstances. So um, that's one of the things that I think is probably the most important part of my book because so many people have asked me about it. And how did I come up with my characters? That's another one. Well, McKenna is the reporter. And um, when I was in Croatia covering the war there, I spent three weeks in the war zone and um, it was my first and only experience in a war zone, but it left this indelible experience and impression on me that I really, it stuck with me. And I thought, this is what I would like to do with my life. But um, then life intervened, and um, while I was uh, thinking about a career as a journalist, um, I ended up getting married, um, having a baby, having a second baby, and then my husband died in a car accident when my children were nine months old and almost three. So then I went into full-on parenting. So that's where, you know, try imagine writing and having a full-time position as a journalist while you're raising two little kids. It's just not really doable. Uh, not for me anyway, because I just loved being a parent. So I put off my career until the last four or five years. So McKenna was sort of um, bubbling in the background this whole time. And I thought, wow, I really want to be this journalist. And I couldn't do it in real life, but I could do it vicariously through this character that I kept thinking about in my head. And before I knew it, she came to life on the page and I just had to write this story. Um, and I wanted to write about um, a serial killer, but not the cookie cutter serial killer. I wanted to write about somebody who had a lot of depth and a lot of interesting background. And so as a journalist, I started doing research regarding human trafficking because it's a huge, you know, it's a huge problem worldwide. But I thought, okay, I can write about this 
and she can do some traveling in the book. But when I started doing the research on human trafficking, I came across uh, in the Ukraine, they were doing uh, research on embryonic stem cells. And I found this really sort of gruesome um, aspect of it, a side effect of it. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is perfect for a thriller novel. So I dug right in. And the more research I did on it, the more excited I got about it and I had to write about it. So that's where the background of the story came from. And then I also needed a medical examiner detective because I wanted someone to be part of the story that could give me the other aspect, the other side of the investigation. And so uh, I came up with Riggs who uh, is, she's a cancer survivor and she's got this um, really amazing uh, resolve, this quiet spirit about her that's very different from McKenna. And she not only investigates the crimes, but she also uh, is, helps with the medical examiner to do the autopsies. So she's writing the action on the other side of the investigation. So between the two of them, you really get a broad spectrum of uh, the storyline and how it gets solved and uncovered and, the, and following all the little um, trails of evidence. So I, I think that that really worked, that that's what I get most of my reviews on. And so I'm, I think that that was probably surprising to me because I thought uh, I would get more reviews regarding the storyline itself. But uh, character is king, as most writers will say. And in this particular case, McKenna and Riggs definitely um, are the stars of the show. And they will continue in the series because I'm working on a sequel right now. And um, uh, also, Another question that I get a lot of is why write a thriller? You know, why not write something else, a romance or something softer? Um, and so I started asking myself that question. And it's kind of like the old question that people ask, okay, so do you see the glass half full or do you see it half empty? And I started thinking about that. And within a few minutes of that, I thought, oh my gosh, I really see that glass half empty. And not only is it half empty, I mean, I immediately took the story further. Okay, it's the only glass of water left and it's half empty and it's in a deserted desert and it's sun's beating down on it, it's evaporating. And you know, now you've got, everybody else knows that it's the last glass of water. So then you, you build this story on it and before you know it, you've got this sort of thriller. <laughs> you know, Before all those dehydrated people get to the glass of water, you gotta figure out a way to get there first. Now you've got a storyline. So that's kind of how it just naturally goes. And um, so uh, also I have some interesting information. People were asking me, why did you set it in Medford? Well, Medford is, uh, I lived there for 20 years raising my children and we just have a great life there. It sits in the Rogue, Rogue Valley and it's uh, got surrounded by mountains and lakes and the Shakespeare Festival and um, Jacksonville. It's just got a lot to offer for family life. So um, I was familiar with it. I thought, okay, best place to write is something you're familiar with. So I set this story in Medford, Oregon. Um, now, there's something very surprising about Medford that a lot of people may not know, and I wanted to read this to you. Um, it's sort of a secret, but it's very interesting. People, my brother asked me, okay, so Jennifer, you know, you set this thriller in Medford, but you know, nothing ever happens here. You know, it's it's such a sleepy little town. Well, here you go. Here's the news. Medford has one of the highest crime rates in America compared to all communities of all sizes. Within Oregon, more than 99% of communities have a lower crime rate than Medford. The chance that a person will become a victim of a violent crime in Medford is one in 200. And Medford has one of the highest rates of motor vehicle theft in the nation, according to the analysis from the FBI. Now this all came from Neighborhood Scout and I checked some other resources as well. So Medford, though it's a sleepy little town in appearance, actually has a very high crime rate. Um, and part of that, some of my research revealed that, you know, there's an aging jail there and it will house 300 uh, inmates, but 
that does that does not near meet the need of Medford. And so, you know, the criminal elements, the criminal life, uh, which I learned from being a police reporter in Fresno, is that they often are very familiar with the system in whatever town that they're in. They're very familiar with how it works, as well as any um, police force or community that works in that. And so they know the jails are full. They know that if they commit various crimes, they're just going to be in the jail and back out on the street before you die because it isn't big enough to hold it. So I know that there uh, is probably some stuff going on in the background as far as raising money for a new jail. And I think they purchased land to do that. But uh, in the meantime, there is a perpetual revolving door. So uh, the crime rate, though it's actually gotten better in the last few years, is still way, way, way above average. So uh, yeah, I think Medford works very well for a crime-based novel. <laughs> so that might be a surprise to a lot of people there in Medford. Um, and, and I also like to talk about um, where I'm going with, uh, as far as my career in writing. Um, you know, most people spend quite a lot of time um, working their skills. You know, your degree in English or journalism and your courses and your classwork to do with writing. And I did as well. I spent a lot of time. I didn't just sit down and go, okay, I think I'll write a book today. Um, although that does happen. I've heard about it, uh, just not for most people. So uh, my career um, really started many years ago when my kids were small and I would go off after I put them to bed at night into another room and sit and write a novel. Okay, well, I never actually finished those novels, but I did start them and I was doing research for them. And I learned a lot during that time. And so then when I finally got an opportunity to uh, write full time, I ended up producing this book. Now, I don't think I would have done it except that we had a financial crisis at the time and I really couldn't find employment and I thought, okay, this is my opportunity. So I'm just gonna write. And I did. And it, I produced this book, which I think is really a fun read. It's gotten amazing reviews and, um, but it wasn't easy. You know, I sent it out, oh gosh, I don't know, hundreds, I would say hundreds of times to agents and publishing houses and I got rejections. And, um, and then I did a lot of rewrites on it and it just sort of sat there. And I thought, okay, after about three or four years, I pulled it back out, maybe it was five years. And I thought, I'm gonna give this another shot. You know, so I'm, you gotta have perseverance. You've gotta really want what you want as far as being a writer and being successful. I mean, that's probably the key element. You know, you have to have talent, but you also have to have perseverance. So I pull it out of the drawer and I'm thinking, okay, I'll send it to just 10, just 10 agents and I'll just see what happens. So I did that. And within about a week, I got a phone call from Mark Gottlieb at um, Trident Media. And I had a few phone calls back and forth. And within about another week, um, we signed a contract. And, you know, at the time I was trying to explain to my husband, this doesn't happen. This just doesn't happen to people, but it did. And so I, it, I was so excited. It was really uh, amazing. It was very fun. And then over the next couple of weeks, uh, Mark sent the, the book out to various publishing houses. And I got, first I got about uh, 12 or 14 uh, no thank yous. I got to read them, which was wonderful because, you know, you never really know what your feedback's going to be. And most of them were like things like, oh, well, it just didn't quite fit our publishing house, or we have another author in-house that's um, very similar, or um, it was a little too uh, gory for me. Um, and so anyway, it was very interesting. But within a couple of weeks, um, Crooked Lane Books agreed to purchase the book and we've got into negotiations and a contract. So um, what I would like to say to other writers is, hey, stick to it, don't give up. If that's what you really wanna do with your life, um, keep at it and have a lot of perseverance. And, oh, I forgot, I wanted to mention, um, I visited Medford a few weeks ago 
and I took a tour of the fire damage area and it just, it was absolutely devastating. Um, it was very difficult for me to, to see that in person. It's like, it's just an endless, endless uh, devastation. And so I just wanted to say to people who are still recovering, there are many, many, many of you, 20, over 2,500 people lost their homes. I just wanted to say, uh, I'm sorry, and I hope that you're doing well and you're able to find the things that you need to find. And I know that I've been reading, I, I subscribe to the uh, newspaper in Medford so that I stay uh, up to bat as far as what's going on in the community. Um, and I did do a book giveaway for people who'd lost their homes. And that was really uh, a lot of fun for me to be able to provide a little bit of joy for someone. And then also um, from that experience, I have here something kind of fun. This is uh, Southern Oregon Magazine. They uh, wrote up uh, a who's who for my book, which I thought was really exciting. And um, there it is. It's right there. <laughs> if you can see it. So that was really fun for a debut author who's not used to having their their book in print like that. That was really exciting for me. And um, and then also in Medford, Barnes and Noble is carrying my book now. My brother sent me a picture the other day, yesterday, and it was just so exciting to see my book on a shelf at Barnes and Noble. So um, anyway, at this time, I would like to see if anybody has any questions. Um, feel free to write them. Carrie, I don't know if you can see the questions now or not. Uh, we don't have any questions yet. We do have one comment from Carrie May saying, hello, I enjoyed your first book and I'm looking forward to meeting you today. Oh, uh, that's so nice, thank you. Yes. So. Um, yeah, everyone go ahead and put your questions into the chat box and um, and we can kind of see what Jennifer Greer is going to say. Um, I have to say I was very uh, delighted to get to meet you uh, when you came to Medford a few weeks ago and um, it it's really cool. I've, I started reading the book this weekend. My copy came into the library and um, I'm what I'm loving as a newcomer to the area is already recognizing the the layout, you know, the way you talk about different places in this area uh, that I'm just like, oh, I know exactly where that is. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Just how you um, really incorporated the the feel of Medford and the surrounding area. Sure. You know, I really feel like when you're writing uh, a book in a, in a setting, um, the place that you set it in, little, I think it literally takes on its own personality. It, it becomes part, a character in the book to some extent. And uh, I set the book, we had a, I had an experience in Medford back, oh gosh, many years ago. And uh, we had a weekend that was particularly hot. It was like 109, 110 every day over the weekend. And so, uh, and then we had this incredibly horrific storm that came in over, over the mountains and hail, you know, the size of golf balls. I mean, it was just, and we, I think we had 700 lightning strikes during that storm. It was really amazing. And so I thought that's, that is the time frame for this book. I'm going to start it while it's really hot. It's going to go into a holiday and then it's going to go into this crazy storm. So that became sort of a personality in the story. It, it set the scene. And then places in Medford that I wanted to use, I was able to, I interviewed um, the medical examiner detective Tim Pike years ago. And he was uh, very nice, gave me a tour of the autopsy room. Um, and I interviewed him a couple times. And so, I was able to use that setting. And then I used to go pretty often because uh, I was in real estate for a little while when I was in Medford. So I would go to Porter's restaurant. So I, I pulled that into the storyline. And um, uh, Jamba Juice was one of the locations. Um, it, Roxy Ann, uh, I used to go up there, take my kids up there for a hike. And the view from there is just beautiful. It's amazing. So I had my characters do the same thing. Um, 
there's things that I'm familiar with, and there's a whole lot more that I, I really want to share, which I will share in various settings in the next ser in the series. Um, but this book starts out uh, in Medford, but quickly goes to the Applegate because I, I there's a buried body there that uh, a bear digs up, and I, that is what actually starts the storyline. So that's fun. I see yeah. that there's two questions there. Uh, we've got another comment here saying, I'll echo what Carrie said. You did a great job incorporating a sense of place. The judge lives just up the street from me, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Cherry Lane, I think. Uh, oh, well, that's great. Yes. Um, so another question that I had, um, who are some authors that kind of inspired you and did you borrow from anyone, um, you know, not borrow, that might not be the right word, but um, which authors did you maybe read for inspiration to write this? Well, it, it started out um, probably, um, it started out, I think, with Patricia Cornwall. You know, she, her lead character was a medical examiner. And um, I have always been someone who likes to read about science. And I like the aspects of medicine. And so for me, that was, that was very interesting, the medical examiner detective style of, of uh, information in a novel. And so Patricia Cornwall and then Tess Gerritsen became uh, another favorite because the same thing, she has a medical examiner detective in her book. And I, um, the science aspect of it always draws me in because you know, you're always learning something new and generally it can be kind of creepy. <laughs> you know, you're in an autopsy room and then there's it's just, there's just something that we don't experience in everyday life. You know, it takes us somewhere we wouldn't normally go. And um, I found that uh, when I felt, discovered the uh, teratoma, uh, that would be the central core of the storyline for this book, um, it was so fascinating for me. You know, and you know, you you look at the the scenes in the book that I wrote, and some of them are pretty dark, and some of them are, you know, I guess the word gross would come to mind. But I am such a finicky person when it comes to violence. I cannot watch violence. I can't watch violence of any kind on TV if it's a show or anything else. I can't watch boxing, so I'm really sensitive to it. I mean, I plug my ears, shut my eyes. I can't watch it. I'm so sensitive, but. When it comes to science and the scenes that would be, you know, would build up into something that's just really heart pounding, suspenseful and scary. I love that stuff. So uh, to write it is really, really fun. And, you know, when you write your first layer, you're just setting the stage. You know, you've got your props out there and you're setting the stage and then you come back and go, OK, um, what if I change the lighting and it, instead of, you know, the sun shining through into that room? Oh, I'm going to draw the drapes. And I'm gonna also make it so that it's it's darker outside. Maybe it's nighttime, and they turn the light on. Oh, oh guess what? The light doesn't work. Um, now you're just a room full of shadows, you know. And and so it you you build and build and build so that you create this suspense. And you know you really want to grip the reader and bring them into the storyline so that they're, uh, you know. And I had a little bit of trouble because. Um, you know, I like to read Stephen King as well and Dean Koontz and they can be a little bit more on a, a supernatural level. And so I had a little bit of a hard time trying to keep that out of what I was writing because it's more procedural. So, but the suspense I think is there. And I think the atmosphere of the storms and Medford being so hot and miserable, um, I think that that also helped with the atmosphere. And I would love feedback from anybody listening, you know, did that work for you? Um, um, you know, and I also played off of things like, okay, I'll ask, what did you, what were you afraid of when you were a child? Um, those are the kind of things I think that we, we sort of draw on as adults, you know, what kinds of things spooked us when we were small? And for me, I had this, uh, we had a couple of really large uh, dogs in the neighborhood across around the corner from us. They were big poodles. 
and they were very territorial. They, they scared everyone, all the kids in the neighborhood. Well, one of them got loose, got into our backyard, and I climbed up on our swing set and was clinging to the very top bar while this dog was leaping with snapping jaws up under me, you know, until somebody rescued me. And I had nightmares about that forever. It was like jaws, you know? <laughs> so, you know, that sense of being suspended and sort of vulnerable and helpless, you know, you draw on that when you're, when you're making a scene, when you're writing a scene. And then again, I had King Kong was another thing for me. He was stomping through the neighborhood and he would, you know, I would wake up like screaming when his eyeballs looking through my bedroom window. And, you know, I, I look back on things like that. And, um, and then I watched the movie when I was very young. Uh, and I don't know if anybody else has seen this movie, the original, The Fly, if anybody has seen that out there. Oh my gosh, I think I was like seven <laughs> when I, I first saw that movie. Just terrified me, you know, the little help me thing. Um, I don't think I'll ever forget it. But, you know, Otherwise, we live in, I live, I've always lived in a very secure environment, more or less. And so uh, I draw on things like that. Um, I also had, I don't know if anybody out there has ever had a stalker. Mm. I don't know if you ladies or anybody's had a stalker. You might make a comment if you have, I'd like to know. Um, there were three times in my life that that happened to me. Uh, mm. Once when I was 13, I had, um, this guy come up to me. I was sitting on my friend's fr front porch. The family had gone out and I was waiting for my friend to come home. And this guy walked up to me, he's probably 30, 35, big, big guy. And he's like, hey, and he started telling me about all the places that he had followed me and watched me through the neighborhood and the people that I'd spent my time with. And then he asked me if he could kiss me. And then I, I, I raced past him as a car drives by and he walks beside me down the sidewalk all the way to my house and says, hey, I'll be seeing you. Well, you know, of course, my parents freaked out. They called the police. And I ended up getting shipped off to my aunt's house in Bakersfield for uh, two weeks. Wow, that's terrifying. Oh, well, the police said, oh, we can break their cycle. Once they fixate on somebody, if you disappear for a while, they move on. So I was about, I was 13 at the time. And it, it just, you know, and I was already, you know, developed young woman and my hair was, uh, long down past my hips, you know, I think it was maybe eye catching. And, and I was always petite. Well, then again, a couple years later, we had this big willow tree in our backyard. And my dad went out there one day and he found all these beer cans and whiskey bottles and stuff under the tree. Well, some guys had been parking out there under the tree right outside my bedroom window. And so we called the police and got that all reported. And, and I, we ended up putting shades up in my room, you know, to make sure everything was, and we cut the, the willow tree branches so they didn't touch the ground. I mean, it just yuck, you know? And then when I was an adult, I was in Fresno, which is where I went to college. That place was the crime capital. I mean, I used to call it Gotham City. I used to be the crime reporter there. Anyway, when I first moved there, I moved in this seemingly nice apartment complex. Well, I'd been there maybe a couple of months and this guy, a neighbor knocked on my door one day and he said, you know, you've got to move, you need to move. And I said, why? And he said, there's these guys that are sitting on, you know, behind your window here, you know, almost every day. And I'm like, who are they? He goes, I don't know. I think they're from across the street. Well, a couple of weeks later, um, the manager comes to my door and he said, the police were outside. They caught this guy, broke into my car, going through my things because he said he wanted to touch my things. <laughs> so obviously I moved, I moved like a week later. So yes. you know, when it's you have those experiences, fear. you know, you get a sense of, of, of this element of danger out there, you know, um, plus I covered the crime beat. So I read all these reports about crime and, and it just became something, um, of interest to me because of the psychology behind it, what drives people, what motivates people to do these things. Um, Absolutely, I, I get that. I um, I know I'm drawn to those stories as well. I think because it's the most terrifying thing I can think of, you know, like being kidnapped or, um, you know, anything along those lines. And so I like to read those stories to maybe desensitize myself to it. Does that make sense? I think it's kind of like if you talk about your worst fear, maybe it kind of goes away a little bit. 
<laughs> you know, um, uh, or you or you experience it in a safe environment, such as in a book or in a movie. Right. It's not actually, you know, it's not happening to you, but you know, it still sort of me checks all those elements that I survived it. You know, I reassured me somehow. Um, yes, you know, and and it did affect me though because you know I had I raised two daughters, so when they're in their teenage years, what did they get in their Christmas stocking? Well, they got pepper spray and uh, taser. So, <laughs> so we have a question here. Um, has the success of your first novel given you enough comfort and confidence to consider yourself a full-time author? I think so. I mean, I, I thought I would feel that way when I was writing my, this novel, but you know, when you're writing with this uh, idea that it it may never go any further than than your desk drawer, it it, so it doesn't really give you that that leg up, that sense of confidence that that this is something I can do. Yeah, you know, I, the, the and so once I'm in this position I'm in now, um, I definitely feel really confident about it. Um, I feel like uh, this is something that I was meant to do because. No matter how, you know, I'll say I'll, I'm going to take a day off. Well, it's still going on. I wake up every day with storyline going in my head or, you know, research I want to do. And I just want to be at my desk working. And it's, it feels a need in me. It's very exciting, you know. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize um, first books generally don't sell very many books. You know, you hear all these stories about, you know, these, oh, it sold 10,000 copies or New York Times bestseller, but most debut books sell anywhere from 250 to 500 books in, an, in a year, in the entire year. So, it, you know, my, my book, thankfully, sold, you know, the first day out, out the door, we had over 2,000 uh, wow. book sales. So, and I don't know what it's doing now because I really don't know how to monitor that. Um, my publisher may have some idea over the next few months, but um, we started out very strong and the feedback I've gotten and uh, the reviews have really helped me feel like, you know, I can confidently write the sequels. Uh, and I've got two more books I'm working on. So that's good. Thank you. <laughs> uh, another question here. Um, what role do you see libraries playing in helping with the success of your novels? Oh my gosh, absolutely. Um, I, I would think they're probably 60% of my initial sales of those first 2000 books were library sales. And for me, I mean, we, everybody sort of uses the internet now for, you know, it's my second brain and all of that, but I, spent the majority of my life in libraries because I was always doing research about one book or another. And I would go home with these big piles of books and you know, there's this atmosphere that you can't find anywhere. I mean, bookstores come close, but libraries just, you know, you go in there and there's this, I don't know what it is. It's the sense of unlimited possibilities. I don't know, for me, I miss the library. And now that I know you guys are shut down for a little bit, but oh my goodness, I miss those libraries. And yes, I love, love libraries are loaning those out. And I know there's been waiting lists for most libraries for my book, which is wonderful. Yes, I, I had to wait a few days um, to get my copy because I was on the hold list and all of the copies were out. I do have to tell you, when I, um, I was going through lists of books to possibly purchase for the library back in, I guess it was May and I saw the title of your book and I didn't know anything about it, but I clicked on it. And the more I read and realized this is not just in Southern Oregon, this is in Medford where I live. And I knew well, we have to get as many copies as we can because a book set in Medford, I know that it's going to fly off the shelves at the library. <laughs> Uh, it's so fun. You know, I, I love it because, and I've had people ask me, and I, it, the, the title, A Desperate Place, is not a reflection of Medford. So, um, <laughs> no, it's not. It, it, the, I originally named the book The Panacea Project, uh, and nobody really knew what panacea meant. You know, it's kind of an odd, oddball uh, word 
in meaning. So uh, I came up with a more something more relatable and a desperate place is sort of a metaphor for the emotional state of mind. Because I tried to find decide what did mo all of my victims in my book have in common? Well, they had a sense of desperation that drove them to make really poor choices. So I thought, okay, a desperate place. So that's where that came from. And then my publisher came up with this amazing cover that went with it so beautifully set for Oregon, you know. Um, Absolutely. So another question that I have, um, like we've said already, this is your debut novel. Um, you, and it's coming out during this strange time where you can't really go on a book tour in a traditional sense. So what is it like publishing your first novel during a global pandemic? Okay, that's a great question. Cause I don't even know what it's like to do it during normal times. But I had a good sense of it. You know, you, you book tours, you have you this near that. You know, my publisher sent me an email saying, hey, Costco wants you to do book signings. And, and I was like, oh, that's great, you know. And then I get, oh, no, that's off. Um, and, and everybody shut down. And so then my book got delayed. It was supposed to come out sooner. Uh, but they wanted to wait till the bookstores opened. And then I found out, oh, well, the bookstores were closed for so long. They're not really ordering any books. They're, they don't, and especially not new authors, you know. So when it, where my book would have come out with a blast and been on the bookshelves everywhere, that didn't happen. So, you know, uh, the first week I'm driving around looking for any store that might have my book, zero, Aww. zero, a big fail. So I was just like, oh my, I'm in tears, you know, oh, this is terrible. I've waited, you know, 30, 40 years to publish a book and finally get it. And, and now it's nowhere to be found. So I was like feeling really sorry for myself. Um, but then, you know, I had to look at it and say, okay, roll up, roll, stop it, roll up your sleeves and figure out how to make this work. So then I went, I got more and more and more active on social media. So, you know, I'm a little on Twitter, not a lot. I'm definitely on Instagram a lot. I'm on Facebook a lot. Um, and I sort of understood how to do, I figured out how to do that. Okay, so Instagram has these, influencers that review books well i i figured that out after i've been on there several several months and and i started you know having my publisher send them copies of the book and um you know little by little by little i have sort of filled in the gaps and when i was in medford i stopped in at barnes and noble and i called the manager there ahead of time and she's like who are you i go no no it's it's, it's in medford you you want to have it in your store oh i don't know maybe i'll order one <laughs> I was like, wow. oh, <laughs> okay. Um, so then I, when I was in Medford several months later, I stopped in there, Barnes and Noble, and I walk up and I go, hey, I talked to somebody on the phone and, and I'd like to know if you have this in my store, in your store. And she goes, I think we have one. And I go, oh, I go, you know, well, it's getting written up in Southern Oregon Magazine and, and uh, I'm getting a lot of great reviews. And this lady was standing behind me and she goes, what book is that? And I showed her my book. I had it in my hand. And she goes, oh, I want to check that out. You know, I heard of that. I'm like, oh, that's great. So anyway, next thing I know, um, the manager did order the book and it's on the shelf there now, which is awesome. And then I visited Jacksonville Bookstore and uh, she's gonna, she was going to order it. And then I visited Ashland Bookstore. They're going to order it. So, you know, it takes some in-person stuff, but you know, I'm running around with a mask, keeping my distance. It just wasn't really sociable. <laughs> so right. It just felt a little awkward. Um, but yeah, it's been really weird. Honestly, I, I would I would normally have had book signings all over the place, but can't do that. So I am, oh, while we're talking about that, I'm giving away five uh, free signed copies for Christmas. If you go on Goodreads, uh, it starts tomorrow, so and it'll go through um, December 14th. So for the next four weeks, uh, you can sign up, go on Goodreads, and then five winners will get signed copies for free. Great. That's good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Feel free to type those into the chat box. Uh, while we're waiting for some questions to go in there, um, I... 
you know, I know your your first career, I guess, was as a, a journalist, and it says that you've include um, your interviews include President Jimmy Carter, Israeli Prime Minister Abba Iban, um, Ralph Nader, authors Isabel Allende and Francine Rivers. Uh, what's your favorite interview that you've conducted? Oh boy, that's a tough one. Um... Well, the interview with President Jimmy Carter was when he visited the University of California, Fresno State, and that was a group full, that was a group interview. Um, the others, um, you know, Francine Rivers, I ended up, I got really, I don't know if uh, people are familiar with her writing, but I, I was able to go to a writer's conference and she ended up needing a ride back. And so I had her in the car and I was, I said, Hey, do you, you know, would you be okay with, you know, me writing about you? And she said, I would love it. So I ended up uh, interviewing her and getting to know her over the course of the weekend at the writer's conference. And that was really fun. Um, she is just a wonderful, amazing person. Um, exceptional writer. And, and that's hard for me because, you know, I have a degree in, literature so and what is that that's that is basically critiquing uh art critiquing the writing styles of art writers and artists and then the other is a journalism degree which is you know all the facts ma'am you know who what when where why and pyramid style present your story up front and the least important at the bottom the reason they do that is because they're going to cut it off at the bottom if it doesn't fit um so, but both of those are critiquing. You know, you have to really critique and weigh what you're going to write. Uh, they're great lessons in writing, but it made it difficult for me uh, to enjoy just leisurely reading. So when I pick up a book, I mean, it's, so, it's often hard for me to get past the first chapter or two because I'm like, I can't stand it. They're not even staying in a viewpoint. Oh my gosh, they're, they're you know, so uh, my husband just rolls his eyes and I, I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I can't stop myself from being the critique writer. So I, I have to really back off of that and force myself to just go for the story, which is what most people do. Most people read for the story, the content, not how it's put on the page. Absolutely. When I was in grad school, I was reading so much for, you know, a purpose. I was reading to finish an assignment or, um, you know, design a presentation or something that it made reading for fun difficult. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yes. Cause your, your job is to analyze. So it, yeah, I have a hard time with that, but I, you know, I have gotten to where I've, I've, especially during this, this COVID time where I've spent a whole lot more time at home, I've been ordering more and more books from authors that I'm not familiar with, some of the newer authors, some of the debut authors, and kind of getting um, a real, a, a broader perspective of what's going on out there in the writing community. And, and a lot of them are younger people too. So they have a little bit different um, uh, nuance to the storyline. Um, so, but you know, I still have my old favorites, you know, Dean Koontz is just such an exceptional writer. Um, so I can't help but be pulled into his stories, but I just started a new set that he had written, uh, the Jane Hawk series. My husband started reading, I ordered it, my husband got a hold of it and he likes it. And so I'm reading it. Um, but, you know, uh, as far as writing goes, um, I'm very critical of my own writing as well. So, you know, I start my day about five every morning and I get my coffee, I read the news, and because I'm a bit of a junk, you know, news junkie, because that's where I get a lot of my stories, you know, my, my ideas about people and, and situations. And then I, then I get busy on my social media for about an hour, and then I'm into my storyline. And the biggest battle I've had is writing my synopsis, because, you know, I don't really want to nail down every single nuance of the storyline. I want to be able to let that be more free flowing as I'm writing it. So although I have the synopsis for the next book finished now, um, I know that it's not set in concrete because I want to be able to have that freedom. Yes. So can you give us a little bit of a hint about what McKenna and Riggs will be up to 
in the future? Yes, you know, um, in this next story, uh, I like the idea of continuing, since it's a series, continuing the titles with the same sort of uh, premise, A Desperate Place. Well, the second one is A Twisted Place. And the storyline is, is very, it takes a lot of twists, a lot of twists and turns. And um, it starts out a few months after A Desperate Place ends. And McKenna is just recovering from what she's been through. And Riggs has got some, a new secret going on in her life. And Christmas Eve, it's snowing. And you get a midnight phone call. McKenna gets a midnight phone call. We got a dead body. And it starts there. And um, I'm using Tucker and Panetta in this one as well. And uh, when I was in Medford, I stopped in at the... Uh, at a coffee shop and talked with two of the medical examiner detectives there and got a little bit of uh, information on some new stuff that they're doing. So there's gonna be a body farm involved. Um, it should be very, I think it's very exciting, lots of twists. And I think it'd be very difficult for people to figure this one out. Okay, we've got another <laughs> question here. What role will McKenna's daughters play in the next installments? Yeah, you know, I didn't include them too much uh, in the in a desperate place. They were in there initially more, uh, but uh, on the advice of my editor, she said, you know, let's it's slowing it's slowing down the the pace of the story a little bit. So I took some of the scenes out that they were in and added some more scenes with Riggs and McKenna together. Um, and this one. Um, the oldest daughter is going to play a, a much, much more of a role because she's interning. She's doing an internship at the newspaper where McKenna, McKenna works. So she wants to be a photojournalist like her dad. So she gets mixed up in some stuff in the storyline that's really not age appropriate for her. So there's some conflict between mother daughter there. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds fun. <laughs> it is. It is. All right. Well, um, do we have any more questions coming in from the audience? We've got a little bit more time left here. Well, let me see what I've got. Um, so um, when I was researching this book, um, I wanted to say, I, I, when I started out with human trafficking, I, it naturally took me to the Ukraine because anyway, there, there was a lot going on there as far as young girls and what, how they're being treated. And I ran across a storyline that, that suggested that some of these younger girls, they were basically prostitutes, that as soon as they became pregnant, they would take the embryo from the young girls so that they could go experiment on it. Now, there's a lot of laws and rules in the US that don't allow things like that. So, but in other countries, Ukraine and China, there was a lot of stuff going on in research that I couldn't find here. And that is why it became part of my storyline and that it was an illegal underground sort of, uh, uh, that only people with some wealthy, wealthy people could could buy into uh, because you couldn't get it here in America. But um, when I discovered what they were doing in the Ukraine with these young girls, uh, I was kind of torn between continuing to write that story, but then it, I couldn't really tie it into the US as well. So I ended up with the teratomas here and that's still an ongoing problem. Uh, we would see a lot more uh, embryonic stem cell research except for that. Um, so it, it's still an ongoing problem. Fascinating. Yeah, I've had several people uh, say, in, in, and they're they're joking, of course, but they're saying, you know, I've had nightmares about those teratomas. <laughs> I wish I hadn't read that, <laughs> which I think is fun. Right, it's good to know um, that you're inspiring someone's nightmares <laughs> in a dark and twisted way. Well, at least it's memorable. And I think that I did some educating, you know, because a lot of people haven't heard about some of this stuff and what's going on in the science aspects of it. So I hopefully it was educational as well. 
Absolutely. Well, I, I started reading it this weekend and I have a feeling I will be done with it um, within the next day or so. It was, I actually had to put it down to prepare for our um, <laughs> author talk today. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. Uh, another question here. Do you think that the current pandemic will feature in a future story? In many ways, I'd rather ignore this part of our current history, but I can see that it can be fodder for some future intrigue. I have every writer, every writer out there is asking that question. You know, how much of this do I include in my story? Because the problem with it is that when these books come out two years from now, um, Will it be gone? Will it be something that everybody's all over and they don't want to hear about it anymore? Um, or um, can we look at it sort of historically? Uh, or, you know, how, how do we as a writer, uh, I, I watched one of the interviews um, with another author and she was saying, you know, I don't know what the future is going to look like. Are we going to be able to shake hands? Are we going to be have our temperature taken before we go into restaurants? I mean, are we ever going to be able to you know, is it always going to be like, you know, you knock in your elbow instead of shaking a hand? <clears throat> are we always going to be six, eight feet apart because people are paranoid? We don't know what the future looks like. So I, I am, you know, before the, the Medford fire started, I was already planning my third book to do with uh, fire in Medford because I lived through a number of summers there where the entire valley is just smoked in. I mean, you can barely breathe from surrounding fires. And I was going to have that be the setting for my third book. Um, <clears throat> so I think what I'm going to do is incorporate the actual fire itself and create some historical elements as I write these stories based in Medford, because I think that's more interesting to people. So there may be some COVID in there. I don't, I, you know, I, I don't think it's right to ignore it. Right. Very interesting. Um... I, like I said, I'm very excited to finish reading this book and then see what a twisted place brings about in the future. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Jennifer, for joining us today. We really, we really appreciate you taking the time out to talk to those of us who still live here in the Rogue Valley. Oh, it's fun. And, you know, once this COVID thing is over, I will be spending a lot more time in Medford because all of my family lives there. You know, my dad, my sister, my brother, all of their family, all of my family lives in Medford. So um, I will definitely be coming and staying for, you know, weeks at a time and, and doing some more research and investigating. Well, great. And hopefully by then we'll be doing in-person programs again. <laughs> and we'll be able to get you uh, set up at multiple right. branches of JCLS. No, that would be so fun. Thank you so much, Carrie. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. And thank you to all of the um, patrons who attended this program today. We really appreciate you um, also taking time out of your day to be with us. And with that, we'll let everyone go back to enjoying their this rainy Sunday. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you. Right, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>